crazy. My God, yeah. Oh, is there anything mirrored? Shouldn't be mirrored. Mirrored? Yeah, it's it's not mirrored, is it? It is, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. She gets sent it back. Oh shit. But it's using the camera, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And is it definitely using the mic? My god. Right. Raz Rev. <clears throat> Okay, sorry about that. So that was apparently that was YouTube's fault for once. <clears throat> Normally it's our fault, and we'd say it's our fault, but uh, yeah, for once it was we YouTube. actually have no idea what happened there. So can everyone? Wait, why is it not? Oh, yeah, it is. Did it's you change the volume? Like can everyone hear us? Okay. Um. Okay, so if you ask the question. In the last stream, will you ask again? Yeah, just pop your question up. Will you press like? If you're on the stream, just quickly press the like button. Uh, I'm just going to run through what I was saying the last time before I got cut off. So we have a weightlifting camp on the 15th to the 18th of April. There is four days of weightlifting, eight sessions of weightlifting, three lectures in the nights after the weightlifting sessions. We have a maximum of 12 slots. We have a couple of tickets left for it. We want to give you guys the best possible experience. We give you four days and learn as much as possible. Three weeks of coaching leading up to it. So some people will be doing a program we have written for the camp. So you can uh, kind of get in shape and get used to our style of programming for the weightlifting camp. So hopefully you can hit some maxes on the, the day or one of the days or a couple of the days, hopefully. Uh, we will give you feedback so we get your technique sorted. So by the time you get to the basing camp, then we can kind of keep working on your technique and work on the adjustments. So you get used to those ideas because obviously they don't immediately happen. Uh, so it's 849 euro per ticket. We have a, a nice mix of people signed up already. Some weight, hardcore weightlifters, some people have come from powerlifting, some athletes who want to do weightlifting for a couple of days. So uh, it should be a great event. We're really looking forward to it. It's on an Epson London, a full weightlifting setup, a great gym. It's half CrossFit. Really, really good gym for, for half, this kind of thing. Half CrossFit, half weightlifting. Uh, it, it's a full setup weightlifting, a couple of platforms, a load of great Alico equipment, uh, great place. It's a great uh, location for the camp. So London's easy to get there for most people. Uh, so there's a couple of slots left. Just email us at seekingstrength at gmail.com if you want to get signed up to it. Uh, okay. So it's there tipping away through the questions. Obviously, if you have a question, pop it in as early as possible. Uh, as you're well aware, they usually get fairly hectic towards the end. So Bathroman101 says, Boys, curious in your thoughts on bodybuilding, especially natural, and how you'd approach programming for it. Uh, bodybuilding, if you're asking like my opinion on it, it's, it's not like my chosen sport, but it's quite interesting in where it's quite similar to powerlifting and weightlifting where a lot of the concepts in bodybuilding are taken on by, by athletes. They're taken on in multiple different sports. So track and field athletes, uh, strength sport athletes, field sports athletes, all these different groups look heavily at bodybuilding for certain aspects of their training. So a lot of the time when you're looking at bodybuilding and bodybuilder training, um, there's two areas of particular focus that are very, very valuable for, for everybody else. The first area, obviously, is hypertrophy. So then gaining muscle size, gaining cross-sectional area within the muscle, um, making themselves bigger so then they can go on to make themselves stronger, more powerful, and faster. Then the second area is, is modulation of, of body size and body composition, which obviously is hugely important for, for almost every athlete. Um, in my opinion... The sport of bodybuilding has some flaws in it, uh, as most sports do. Uh, one of the the bigger areas that I kind of see the flaw with bodybuilding is in the kind of qualitative aspect of, I think this person looks better versus Gurf might think that person looks better. It's hard when there's no real objective measurement um, of, of what success looks like. I think also in bodybuilding, there's, as with other sports, there's massive amounts of genetic elitism and and unless you're born with 
abs that tend to stack in a certain direction where you have really, really well-defined uh, different groupings within the abs, unless you have a propensity to gain muscle quite easily, uh, a propensity to or a natural inclination towards lower body fat percentage. Bodybuilding is an incredibly difficult sport for you, not only to, to get started in, but for you to be successful in. And I think you see a lot of people kind of start off down the bodybuilding road and they'll end up going from bodybuilding where they think they want to be a competition bodybuilder to then going bodybuilding where they might want to be a physique competitor or a natural physique competitor. And then a lot of the time we inevitably see people drifting off into the areas of powerlifting, CrossFit, weightlifting, all these separate areas where they'll look for just a slightly different challenge. Um, but I think bodybuilding, we have a lot to owe bodybuilders um, in terms of not only looking into hypertrophy and, and the other area of kind of body weight control and body composition control, but also uh, bodybuilders have been obviously experimenting with a huge amount of other stuff for, for many, many, many years. And that kind of knowledge comes over into high performance sports then on top of that as well. So I, I people like to rag on bodybuilders. It takes a huge amount of, of commitment, takes a huge amount of uh, sacrifice in, in almost every area of your life to be very, very good at bodybuilding. Um, so I certainly wouldn't rag on it too much. It's not for me. It's not the sport. I'd like to, to kind of put a huge amount of time or commitment or sacrifice into um, but certainly bodybuilding is is an important area of, of study. It's, I'm very, very glad people have put their entire lives into bodybuilding um, and kind of made the mistakes so we don't have to make them. Of doing bodybuilding. <laughs> I think um, in terms of not not natural bodybuilding, I think it's uh, thought to the moment. Or it's, it's crazy how many younger people are dying. So Derek Boston Lloyd died recently. He was 29. There was an Irish gentleman, Scott Murray. I'm not sure what age he was, but I'm almost certain he was in his 20s, if not early 20s. Now, we don't know if he was using performance-enhancing drugs, but he was still part of the bodybuilding culture. You know, I think you can lump people into bodybuilding, even if they're not competing. So, like, physique-orientated people, so extreme physiques are their priority. Uh, I think for the vast majority of people who do bodybuilding, it's a positive impact in their life, so a healthier lifestyle, regular exercise, uh, trying to pursue mastery of a discipline, uh, friends and family and stuff they encounter along the way you know there's a lot of benefits to natural or unnatural bodybuilding but I think as well then there's kind of a darker side to it you know we were literally talking to a very high level athletes recently who used to bodybuilding especially female athletes uh, who said they developed a very poor relationship with food and you'll hear this a lot from former kind of bikini-esque or physique orientated female bodybuilders that end up with a very poor relationship with food after and it's something they'll talk about taking a very very long time for them to adjust to back to normal so um you definitely see lads have certainly developed eating disorders as well but uh credence or credit goes to the female population of bodybuilding or post-female bodybuilding as they'll talk about it a lot more and they'll talk about how their relationship with food is was terrible for a period of time when it was when they were primarily competing in bodybuilding um you don't see that as much as men. Now, I don't know if the prevalence of the eating disorders is as much because you don't see men ever talking about it. That doesn't mean it's not present. And I would warrant it's definitely present in different manners. But uh, you just see the female population in bodybuilding talk about it a lot more. Uh, it's definitely something that is kind of tra not traumatic, but it's definitely kind of sad to see is it's something that is uh, can be very life altering and in a very insidious way of ruining your life using those kind of poor habits. That's not bodybuilding's fault. That's the person who engage with bodybuilding and maybe the people they got advice from in bodybuilding's fault, but it's not necessarily bodybuilding's issue as a, as, as a thing, you know, it's just the, um, the younger athletes are at the moment taking incredible amounts of performance enhancing drugs. Now there's a lot of them in their kind of thirties and forties who die as well. And that's not so much the drugs fault, but primarily the, massive amounts of body weight they have you know the huge high blood pressures that they'll routinely go through throughout the years they'll be heavily heavily in the upper limits of what you know their organs could sustain in terms of lean body mass so just the amount of muscle tissue they'll be at like five five and they'll be like 140 kilos of eight percent body fat or lower for a lot of the year you know and it's just very hard to maintain that and not expect adverse health consequences you know 
the level of drugs they have to take as well is just something that's kind of you know unfortunate for bodybuilding to reach a certain level you know there's no way around it like if you want to be mr olympia then you have no choice but to take a certain minimum level of porn sensing drugs and this minimum level is enormous compared to like general population performance dancing drugs you know if you go into any uh, random commercial gym or any cross the gym you'll be like how much drugs are you taking if you get not a sensor they'll be like i take austrian every day of the year and it's like this much and then if you got a real honest answer from like, one of mr olympias they'll be like i take this much in my off season you know a lot of times the vast majority of them are never honest about how much they're taking People like to lie, they like to upplay their genetics, upplay their hard work, downplay the amount of drugs they're taking to make it seem like they didn't need that much. They're like, no, I just take TRT and a little bit of insulin. Yeah. And uh, just stay at like 130 kind of low body fat. And I think there's problems with lying to people about the amount of drugs because if someone goes ahead and takes performance enhancing drugs and they're physique orientators, they will think, fuck, if he's only taking that much and I'm yeah. half as size of him and I'm twice as fat. I'm going to have to take way more drugs. So there's a bad problem in regards to that. However, then if they said how much drugs are actually taking, then you'd end up an issue being like, well, if that's a, I want to be Mr. Olympia. Yeah, so yeah, that's what yeah. I got to do, you know, successfully is clues. So that's the amount of performance enhancing drugs that I have to take. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of problems with bodybuilding. I think it's a lot of people, very, a lot of positives, you know, and it's been huge for the fitness industry and all the money invested in it and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of program to it, which we neither of us really talked about, the programming idea is quite simple. Um, you know, progressive overload, increasing number of reps uh, to a certain extent. You know, you would be looking for a lot of 1RMs as a bodybuilder. You'd be using a certain amount of high weight, high rep compound exercises, but maybe to half the extent you'd see of someone, you know, one of our athletes in weightlifting or one of our track and field athletes or rugby players, you know, you'd see uh, the... The, the actual exercises would be quite similar to a certain extent. There wouldn't be a massive deviation, but the volume spread across those. So, you know, there'll be a lot of squatting and benching, for example, but there'll be a lot more volume of other exercises uh, compared to the assistance work we'd see for our sports athletes, for example, whatever you want to call them. And so you'd just be looking for progressive overload. You probably wouldn't really be straying down below five or six reps in most parts. You would still be staying rather than cycling through like 10 sixes, threes, twos, and ones, you'd probably be cycling through like 12s, 10s, eights, maybe sixes, but probably not that low. And you just go 12s, 10s, eights, a little bit heavier weight again at 12s, 10s, eights. And then you'd be looking at manipulating the body weight. Uh, where do you need to go? Are you going down towards a competition? Or are you in the off season and you need to progressively gain some weight? Then you'd be monitoring body fat levels. You'd be monitoring those other metrics, sleep, blood pressure, uh, even for especially for your natural athletes and you just be slowly working up and trying to gain as much lean tissue as possible without gaining excess fat so the principle is simple but uh the the uh i put into practice it takes a lot of due diligence the last thing i'd say on bodybuilding and it's kind of it's something i definitely come up with a lot when i owned the gym and i was coaching people in person an awful lot more is bodybuilding has a massive issue uh with people's expectations or people's thoughts about where they can get to uh, and this has gotten so much worse than when we kind of started training people are used to now picking up their phone going on instagram they'll follow like a fitness influencer that guy or girl will be in phenomenal shape and they'll put up posts all year round of them being in phenomenal shape and i think people downplay how out of the ordinary that is or how unachievable that is for the vast majority of people um people being over 100 kilos or 110 kilos with visible abs all year round it's you're either genetically massively predisposed to that and without any diet or training you're probably going to sit pretty close to that anyway or else you're massively enhancing your your ability to hold that that body shape size and comp composition and i think that is if the health concerns and the dietary concerns and all of that is is a major issue with bodybuilding from the actual logistical side of things and the danger side of things i think in terms of like a slightly more 
soft sided thing of why people aren't going to get on very well with bodybuilding, particularly natural bodybuilding or uh, amateur level bodybuilding is that the idea of what's achievable for the vast majority of people is just completely, um, completely skewed, you know, unless you're 16 to 19 years old, you have quite good genetics, you have somewhat of an athletic background, and you're being helped along the way, like those physiques probably aren't achievable for most people. Uh, certainly, if you have a full time job, and you have a family or a kid or other uh other responsibilities going on in the background and you can't control every aspect of it. I think for most people, the Ross Edgley style physique just isn't going to be doable um, on normal protocols, normal diet, normal training, unless you're a freak and you have some other stuff. Do you know, I know we've been talking about this for a good few minutes, but no one ever asked about bodybuilding and, and uh, there's obviously a lot of thoughts on it. But that's a great point is that a lot of times you'll see, so we're going to lump these physique people in, these influencers with bodybuilding. So we'll just say, not even bodybuilding, but physique orientated, bodybuilding, the act of bodybuilding. Um, the physiques they will have are not necessarily impossible to achieve by a lot of people who are natural, but the vast majority of those did not achieve it through the use of natural means. <laughs> and it does skew men's kind of uh, perception of what is possible or was possible with a certain amount of genetics and work, you know, so it skews everyone every which way. Um, like the amount of people you'll see in just commercial gyms who take form enhancing drugs for uh, physique, you know, and uh, as we always talk about, we know we don't have any problem with that. And we don't uh, literally does none bother. of our business, none of our business. Absolutely. But I think it does skew. Uh, so in the same way we say, we see a lot of females talking about having issues from eating disorders from bodybuilding. I think you'd see a lot more men talking about how they might not be comfortable with their physique, especially men who didn't do a lot of sports when they were younger and they get to their twenties and they're not physically in good shape. They don't feel great about themselves. And then they look at these influencers are like, okay, these are the pinnacle. So maybe someday I might look like them, but then they go into the, their commercial gym and they see loads of lads who are in phenomenal shape who also use foreign sensing drugs. Now the argument that is, those lads don't have any obligation to tell anyone that they're in performance sensing drugs. The average Joe Show doesn't need to tell randomers in the gym. But it's funny how that's the direction it's gone. And these lads will come into the gym and they'll be, you know, muffin top, skinny fat, not strong, not confident in the gym because they're not used to it. And they look at these lads' physiques and they'll be like 18 year olds who are absolutely shredded, like just fucking feathers. And jacked too. Feathers on their delts and triceps, you know, and they're just taking a lot of arms. And again, it's not their responsibility to tell anyone, but it's funny how the whole perception gets more skewed every year. I'm, I'm certain, I'm absolutely certain that the amount of amateur performance enhancing drug users just goes up massively every year. Um, so it's, it's um, is it a bad thing? probably overall it's probably yeah. not great but then overall there's a lot of people going to the gym more than ever so um who knows bathroom man that's uh, a very lengthy answer to your question but we never talk about this yeah so, yeah yeah so there's a lot of thoughts uh how's my finger my finger's doing great uh unfortunately i went from six months in a splint and no movement to six weeks six weeks not six months six weeks <laughs> then i went to the competition and obviously i wasn't going to wear the splint to show weakness uh so i went from Six weeks in a splint with zero rehab and zero motion to full maximum isometric opening and closing. So obviously, for some reason, no, another a week. no one knows why. It's like somebody, It's if only someone has said that a week before the competition to you, then maybe we'd start moving it around. No. Just start moving it. Somebody did say that to you. And that was wrong. You no, were, that was not wrong. No, I couldn't move it because my finger was still, um, you said that, but that was wrong. Um so I couldn't move it even up until basically six weeks would have been just the weekend of the competition. Um, so it was still kind of the the set point was still slightly bent. It was getting straighter every week, but uh, I couldn't really start the rehab then. Uh, so I taped my fingers. So I just strained the tendon a little bit too much. So I didn't rupture it again, obviously, but uh, I just kind of uh, not even spring, but a similar kind of sprain to the tendon this time was supposed to a rupture, which is fine. Um, I could do full closing and, of my fist now and hold it and open it up and it'll go back to its set point position. So now I just need to start doing actual rehab. So I just need to wear the splint for another bit. But I, I said it to the consultants when I went back to see them, I was like, look, I'm going to do a competition and I probably, what'll happen if I hurt it again? 
And he was like, you can just wear the spent again. It's not a big deal uh, if you rupture it again. <laughs> He's like, if you just rupture it again. Uh, it was funny. The first doctor was like, no, you can't do anything. And then I saw the consultant and he was like, look, if you if you rupture it again, you can just wear the spent again for six weeks and uh, it'll come back to normal. Um, so, yeah, it's soon, Grant. Uh, uh, Bathroom Man has another great question. We're probably not going to spend a massive amount of time on it because we we did just spend 20 minutes on your last one. But Bathroom Man, you're asking, would be interested on your approach to bringing up children to be athletic, stroke, successful at sports, uh, probably something you can make a whole video on. There's We did make a whole video on this, didn't we? Ask? I don't remember. The, the multi athlete fallacy thing. Yeah. So the first thing, the first thing. Oh, Zach's here. Hello, grassroots. Zach. Hello, Zach. Zach Talander. Yeah. Big Z. Big Z. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, so the first thing, right, that I take into account if I was looking at the ideal case scenario, right, if uh, Sikistan had 10 babies who got dropped off at our door and you had to make whatever athlete you wanted to make out of them, for the first probably eight to 10 years of their life, you just want to make sure, uh, besides all the normal stuff that they're growing up healthy and happy and they get food and sleep and they feel safe and all that. In terms of their athleticism, the more broad you can make the bottom of that triangle, the better. So you don't just want them playing a field sport. You don't just want them doing a strength sport, a power sport, anything like that. What you really want is you want to build physical literacy. So them understanding how to move their body through space, them having a good uh, understanding of kinesthetics, proprioception, all those things. Uh, sports that would commonly come to mind for that would be things like gymnastics, capoeira, things along those lines where people are really learning how to move their body build stability, build proprioception. Then what you're probably looking at between the ages of 8 and 12 is them starting some sort of sport. Uh, usually you'd want them to start as many different kinds of sport as possible. That's firstly to, to continue that building of physical literacy, to continue that developmental pathway that's quite broad and wide and building resilience in their, their kind of different systems, whether that be muscle, bone, joint, all of those. But also you need them to figure out what kind of sport they want and you need to figure out what kind of sport they're good at. So this is all along the lines of developing a high level, very, very effective athlete. If um, if I was a child in this system and they brought me in and just dropped me in a weightlifting gym immediately, no matter what they did to Dara Fitz, he's never going to be a, a high level elite professional international weightlifter. It's just not going to happen. It's my parents' fault, really. Uh, if you dropped Gurf in to be a NBA basketballer, it's probably never going to happen either, right? So a broad selection of sports, you'll build that physical literacy, you'll build that developmental stuff, but also you'll get to see that little Timmy or little whatever its name is. Do you see what uh, Elon Musk called his latest child? You were saying that, yeah. Crazy. Uh, if you drop them in, you want them in multiple sports, they'll start to figure it out. It might be that their other friends go and play this sport, but usually it's that they have some affinity towards that sport. You'll probably develop with that multi-sport athlete until the ages of around 14 to 16. In certain cases where early or early specialization is vital, um, professional soccer would classically be incredibly early specialization. That's to do with the setup of the actual sport itself and how skill dominant it is. But then you also have sports that have to be early dom or early specialization sports. These will be things like gymnastics, particularly female gymnastics, where for the actual movements themselves, it's better to have a younger athlete there. There's a number of examples that early specialization is important in. For the vast majority of kind of field sports, uh, even Olympic sports to that, to that line, 14 to 16 is about the time where you start seeing a lot of those additional sports being shed off, your training frequency in that one specific sport will probably skyrocket or certainly increase as that kind of extra time that's been taken up by other sports starts to be shed off. You can go from two rugby sessions a week to four rugby sessions a week or whatever that might be. And then you're looking at between the ages of like 16 to 18 pushing the actual body shape and body size of that athlete in the direction it needs to go in. So certain morphological changes are very, very easy to make in, in developing athletes and developing teams. 
whereas they're going to be quite difficult to make as a 22 year old or a 24 year old if you're already a professional athlete in that system so if you have a an ice hockey player you know they need to be around 90 kilos when they're going to be playing adult or senior hockey uh you don't want them to have to make up that that 20 kilo deficit or that 15 kilo deficit in the course of a year or even six to eight months ideally you want to be pushing them in that direction for three years as they kind of go in towards adult sport so and make no mistake you should be pushing them <laughs> yeah one thing when you're picking kids uh, sports for your kids you just let your kid do whatever they want put them in as many places as possible you can like force them to go to different sports until they try it out and give it a few weeks and um, certainly in my case my parents just put me into every sport and then i just get to choose what i did and didn't want to do I'm going to say something that can only be backed up by anecdotal evidence. Go on. But I think you see the personality traits for kids who are going to be successful in sports basically from like the ages oh of like five or six. I, I think from two or three. Um, I yeah. think just from, and I think a lot of people will probably agree with you, and I bet you if you did a huge survey of a load of different coaches in different sports, you'd see that, um, you know, who are going to be into sports for all life. I remember when I was like five, I just was watching like Bruce Lee, into the dragon fist of fury or whatever and just being like i want to take on though and then i got my black belt within like five years you know training like there was something again that did like seven hours of taekwondo on like friday saturday and sunday like when i was like eight nine ten you know um and i think you'll just see that with loads of different people uh they'll just at the younger age if they're going to be doing a lot of sports their life it's going to be from day one you know yeah you, you, 100%. you don't see teenagers suddenly being like i'm gonna play for monster no it's no Someone's going to tell them by the time they're 15, like, you're going to play for Munster. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Ante Aziz Norbekov. Hey, lads, you guys said that everyone should lose weight to around 12% body fat, but you also mentioned that you need to stop caring about body ratios and gain weight. Uh, how do you balance between the two? For example, I'm nearly one year into weightlifting, and I'm around 18% body fat and progress has been great, but I'm afraid it's all going to go downhill if I cut down to 12%. So... What you need to do is just kind of put context on this, you know, put some uh, put some situational awareness onto where you are. For example, if you are 18 years old, you are six foot two or something, and you've been weightlifting for three years, and you're 18 percent body fat, you don't really need to worry too much about the 80 percent body fat. Um, you can keep training. You have a lot of progress to make um you know you've a lot of training left to do you don't want to solve that momentum you've got going when you are on the kind of that kind of gravy train of your latter half of your puberty when you're going into your late teens and early 20s uh you you know you're an 18 year old male and you want to continue your weightlifting career you don't really want to be cutting weight aggressively and we've talked about that before how cutting weight is detrimental and so one of the big things that was very useful from the soviets point of view is they had so many numbers of weightlifters and that was one of the things they saw that athletes who continually cut it cut it who cut weight when they were younger uh was a great indicator of how much they'd limit their progress later on and gaining weight was a much better progress of how long their career how long their progression would last so we're not only talking about upper end numbers but also we're talking about how long the progression lasted so uh if you're 18 that six foot two or whatever 80 percent body fat you know that's a situation where you don't need to be worried about cutting weight is that kind of the stream got funny? I think you're Googling stuff there. So exactly. Yeah, so stop that. Um, but however, if you're 45 years old, you're five foot five, you're 100 kilos, and or let's say you're like 90 kilos or something, and you're 18% body fat, um, then it might be a time to be like, look, weightlifting progress is important, but in this scenario, I think I could be a little bit less sloppy and not affect my weightlifting progress. You know, if you're 45. And you're 80 body fat you aren't going to be snatching 200 kilos for example so the negatives that you incur when you cut body weight aren't going to be as drastic because the absolute weight you're lifting just aren't as demanding on any human's body um you know let alone your body for example so your absolute weights there are kind of put in balance and context with the body fat percentage you have the weights you're lifting now what's smartest for you is it better if your performance you cut weight in the long run as opposed to the short run? Um, so, for example, if you go back to the eighteen-year-old, his body weight ratios might not be great now. So, if he's like six, six foot two or whatever, and he's snatching hundred kilos, but he just snatched hundred kilos after snatching ninety kilos four weeks ago, is that a terrible time to cut body weight? Absolutely. That ratio in this very moment, if we zoom in really close on this current training cycle, 
we go, oh, this that ratio is not great. But in all likelihood, if he's a talented athlete training hard, he could be snatching 120 in six months' time. And suddenly his ratio looks a lot better without changing his body weight. So when we get to these scenarios, we always just put a bit of context on them, where the athlete is in the training, how old they are, health concerns, uh, performance concerns, desires, uh, how you feel about your physique. So context kind of matters in these scenarios when it comes to weightlifting. You know, if you're 18, you've been lifting for five years, you might have a career in weightlifting. If you're 45 and you've been lifting for two years, you probably don't, almost certainly do not have a career in weightlifting. So just putting context on these things is what matters. Deciding where you are. Um, you know, for example, in my scenario, I want to lose weight because it'd be better for my weight of thing. It might be worse, slightly worse for my absolute strength, but it's better for, uh, you know, mobility, for speed. It's the main two I'm looking for. Uh, so context always matters in these. You know, there's a lot of different variables at play. So I hope that answers. I think the other thing you want to look at for the body composition stuff in amateur sport in general, you want to look at, Garf mentioned a few positives there in terms of weightlifting specifically where you'll have better mobility and better speed under the bar. You also need to look at things like, are you going to be overall just lower general inflammation levels if you're carrying less body fat? Are you going to be more satisfied with your training? If you're going to the gym all the time, so if you're powerlifting and you're 30 kilos overweight, if you're 130 kilos and you're six foot tall, it's generally more difficult to motivate yourself to go training when you're in worse shape. Also, your ability to recover in between sets, your ability to recover in between training sessions will almost certainly increase. You'll also just have less likelihood of, of kind of adverse health risks that come from being slightly heavier when you're when you're training. So I will say, unless you're the developing athlete that Gurf described earlier on, most of the time being in better shape, like you if it takes you six or eight weeks to get there and you have two months of non-ideal training as you're cutting down body weight you'll get back to those previous numbers much quicker and that's something people don't pay enough attention to is that retraining or getting back to previous 1rm numbers is so much easier than it is to get to those 1rm numbers first day if you squatted 100 kilos and it took you eight months of training to squat 100 kilos and you then took a month or two off because you were sick or you had to move away for work when you go back to 100 kilos for the second time, you could be talking about 30% of the total time it took you to get there or even less. The retraining to get back to an old number is so much easier. So if you're talking about a total now, you might have a 220 kilo total at the moment. It might take you four months to cut down from 18 to 12% body fat, depending on how aggressively you go. Then after that four months, when you have had non-ideal training, you might have a 180 kilo total or 190 kilo total the retraining to get back up to that level is so much easier than the training was to get there originally even though you'll be at a lighter body weight um have you noticed look where i'm losing fat for my neck for your neck that's mad big it? thick neck like it's weird where like your genetics uh determine where body fat yeah goes that's so strange yeah what the fuck hopefully it's going from my heart as well <laughs> okay um <clears throat> where are we got this one here it says it uh what's the deal this is thomas clark what's the deal with that russian skater who got popped i don't know thomas i was googling it there but then girl gave out to me for googling things yeah. she got popped uh a couple of days before her performance at the 2022 beijing winter olympics uh i have no idea i haven't been watching any of that i to be honest, I, I haven't really had my head in current sporting events too much besides the Six Nations and some domestic rugby. But uh, I think she was popped. I don't know what she was popped for, but there was multiple other Googles about the substance she was popped for. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. I can't really comment on it. Uh, it's disappointing. She had a very poor performance in the Olympics following that. So obviously it was weighing on her quite heavily. Uh, so, yeah, I don't I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, so then there is Anton Lopez saying, when I'm trying to pull the snatch as much as possible in second and third pull, I often end up writing the snatch down. Is this correct? So the answer is no, that's not correct. But if you're a beginner, that is totally fine. So that is correct if you're a beginner. So one of the hallmarks of elite weightlifting is maximum bar height to where the bar finishes at the bottom of the overhead squat in the snatch. 
this distance here reduces as the proficiency of a weightlifter increases. So this distance gets smaller and smaller as your technical proficiency increases. Now, one of the hallmarks of a beginner weightlifter is this distance is really fucking high. Um, so it's a very, very long distance. A lot of weightlifters will catch it high and write it down. So this will naturally decrease as your timing and proficiency increases. Uh, a lot of times this will require a bit of over pulling the barbell for a period of time as you learn from full extension. Uh, you learn how to relax and contract and get under the barbell faster with your timing. So typically beginner weightlifters timing is very, very slow and it's just something they need to practice and get used to. So right now it's better to have full movement through all requisite positions. So moving through your first, second and third pull fully in the full extension, whatever that means for your body type and your musculature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once you've learned those correctly, your timing from hitting full extension to getting under faster and bar height will get better as you go on. So you don't need to particularly worry about it for a period of time. Uh, if this is something you've been still doing into, you know, two, three years beyond, then it's a time where you need to learn how to pull under faster. You need to get better precision of bar height. You need to understand where the barbell is after you extend. A lot of times you'll see beginner lifters extending for too long and that's okay. So they'll spend a lot of time extension You'll see them visibly elevate themselves with the barbell. The barbell will still be going up. They'll be still in a full extension. The barbell will be traveling and it'll be almost motionless before they get under. Whereas a great lifter like Gabriel, for example, looks like he's pulling under at the beginning of his second pull or, or, or halfway through his second pull. So it's just a proficiency thing. So again, kind of context of where you are. Are you a beginner weightlifter? Then it's fine. Are you five years into your basement career? Then it's something you need to address. If you are going down that line of beginning to address that issue, there are certain pitfalls that uh, that come in very, very regularly. The first pitfall you'll almost always see is people will cut their extension short completely. So you'll have gone and you'll have identified that you're over pulling the bar, whatever you want to call it. You're pulling the bar too high and and, and dropping down after you've cut it. The big thing you see then is people don't extend at all. So they'll kind of just pop the bar up they'll never actually reach their full vertical height and that works fine when you're at like massively submaximal percentages it will feel very fast it will look very fast the barbell will be moving very fast when you're at 60 70 75 percent of 1rm the second you start to go a bit heavier with that new technique where you're getting under the bar faster and um, the bar will just fall out in front every single time because you'll never have actually extended upwards that full extension is vital for you being able to achieve those maximal lifts. So once you do then cut the pull short, you're shagged for use of a better term. And um, so that is definitely something to be to be wary of is people tend to, once they want to get under the bar faster, they'll just hop it off their hips, cut their pull short and, and really try to, to be fast under the bar where the bar never achieves its proper arc at the top. Uh, the other thing you need to watch in that case as well is because of that hopping the bar off the hip, we tend to swing the bar out in front of us an awful lot more. So rather than us making contact at the hip and having a small passive elbow bend as you come under, people a lot of the time will keep the elbow straight and swing the bar out and around in that kind of pendulum fashion and it will start swinging back behind them, which obviously is non ideal as well. So if you are in the case where you're now beginning to work on it, make sure you don't sacrifice other elements of your technique in hopes of becoming faster and catching the bar at a lower point. Uh, Wido says, thoughts on doing box squats rather than HG squats reduce fatigue during rugby season and pre-season. So we have some conflicting thoughts on this between the two of us. It's on the rare things we probably yeah. half, no, a third disagree with some of it. So aside from box squats, and I've got to make a generalization here that Gurf isn't going to agree with, and that's why I'm saying it now before he gets to talk realistically for almost every rugby player in the world you can be squatting to within an inch or three inches of parallel on the high side of that you want to be focusing on moving the barbell as quickly as possible with as much weight as humanly possible for you right now and that's all that matters that's all the large-scale studies that have been done in rugby players and professional rugby players when they're looking at both making them stronger and faster, but also when looking at limiting ACL tears and general knee injuries over the course of a season, you will lose less time. So that the important marker for, for 
professional rugby players is losing like every time lost due to an injury. So every time you miss a game or every day of training miss, they'll they'll measure those. The major factor for those is getting the squat to be as strong as possible. Doesn't matter how deep it is. It doesn't matter to a box. Uh, for a lot of people using a box to make sure they're limiting that depth and just to make sure they're not crashing into the bottom position, using that box will reduce fatigue. It will allow you to squat heavier weights. And so for me, on the right-hand side of the Sika table, the correct side of the Sika table, uh, box squats during season and out of season are applicable. Now, that being said, I have two rugby players on my books at the moment and neither of them are box squatting. So take that with a pinch of salt. But in the idealist realms of the Sika Strength Rugby Academy, everyone squats kind of high and some of them will squat to a box. So there is... One study which came out of, I think, the is it the Leinster Academy or the Irish or this Institute of Sports, one of them. The squats, the parallel one. Yeah. So That's the Leinster one, yeah. So they saw less injuries with their rugby players when they only squatted to just about parallel to a box. So my argument is... That was the previously referenced study. That was a previously <laughs> referenced study. And I think their findings were correct for their athletes. My argument would be to from the ground up principles would be teach the younger athletes, especially in their teens, uh, correct squatting bar form with a high bar uh, or low bar, depending on their builds and their size and what position they're playing in, uh, teach them to squat to a pretty deep depth, but you'd be working on things like mobility, uh, technique with the lifts. This requires a lot of time, uh, a lot of addressing, a lot of understanding of how to get an athlete to that position. So I think, I would bet if those same athletes that were involved in that study, who are all very, very good athletes, and the study I bet was very well done, and I bet their findings were correct for those athletes, but I bet if you had those athletes in their teens, especially their early teens or even late teens, depending on what time you got them, and put them through maybe a better way of getting through to that squat position, uh, getting quality high bar squats in, I bet you wouldn't have seen the same results for those athletes later in their career. Uh, so some of the benefits from that, those full depth squats would be better tendon ligament resistance. So uh, tendons require a lot of force. Fascia requires a lot of speed uh, to initiate changes in it. So if you're looking at like your, your fascial tissue or tendons and ligaments, they need high forces, uh, something between, you know, less than or faster than one meter per second. They need like athletic endeavors, um, you know, the velocities of uh, chiropractic readjustments will actually do increase temporary range of motion happen at 0.2 meters per second. So if you get to, a, if you could get to a place, now this is obviously an ideal world, but if you could get to a place where you as an individual player could end up with great mobility and terrifically good looking high bar squats, I think you'd get a lot of benefit from those. But then I think there's more context on that. So that would be definitely in the preseason. And then I think a little mix of each of those in the on season would be a little bit of mix of those. So you're like, you're staying loose, you're staying fast and fresh with your high bar squats at like 100 kilos uh, or whatever it is, but your max is like 180 uh, or whatever, you know, you you go by like at bar speed and how you feel on those particular sessions. But then you keep that force production high and you keep that heavy weight in certain parts of the season where you just go for those really heavy weights. And there's definitely benefits to this where I think we've talked about this a couple of times before where to a certain point, absolute weight, just a lot of weight has a very positive effect on your organism. There's just a different effect on your organism that other things don't have. Changing other variables just won't have the same effect as a fuck ton of weight because a fuck ton of weight is undeniable for your body to adapt to. For everybody, I don't care who you are, even if you're 200 kilos, half Torb Bjornsson, 300 kilos on your back is still pretty heavy. 300 kilos isn't something you're going to squat cold. is isn't something you're going to do every day without massive issues you know that's something that does happen and absolute weight does have unique positive benefits to it and i think there is definitely for rugby who i think on average is something like a car crash a game or was it two or three car, three crashes? car crashes three car crashes a game is something the, the physical forces that rugby players experience through pretty intense games and i think one of the best ways of bulletproofing yourself for that kind of thing is just a shitload of heavy weight and there's a shitload of heavy weight can be done very well and pretty safely uh, on uh, on parallel box squats you know um so i think there's a place for both of them 
but I think there's probably the the seat at the table for high bar full depth squats is probably missing in rugby, and that's probably just due to uh, environmental demands. It's just really hard to coach a lot of 25, 25, 15 year olds in a, a gym yeah. session. You know, that's unfortunately just the nature of that. But and maybe a certain kind of deficit in knowledge in a little part of those otherwise great coaches S and C stuff. You know, they just mightn't have. I think that the other opportunity. The other thing with that group of fifteen year olds is. Due to the nature of rugby, the really strong rugby players, like front rowers, uh, Porter, Ty Furlong, these, <laughs> these kind of massive men, right? You're talking about at 18 years old, squatting north of 250 kilos for reps. So it's... To a box. To a box. But they're shifting massive amounts of weight, you know? And it is, like you'll see the All Blacks, in a few of the videos we've done reviewing the All Blacks training, really nice high bar squats. Lovely. Almost all of them are going so far below parallel. They're obviously finding huge success with that. They're an incredibly athletic team. It's obvious that the coaching pushes them in that direction, and it clearly works for them. They're one of the best rugby teams in the world. Uh, and myself and Garth do disagree on it, but it, it's like we both agree on the important things that people need to lift heavy quite frequently, and this is a tiny nuanced area of it. Uh, but that is the, the last thing I'd say is that these players who are very strong could realistically be at their strongest between the ages of 18 and 21. But that's for a few different reasons as well. Yeah. The, what I'm saying though is what you actually do with your athletes though. Yeah. But in, in practice. Yeah. What I do with mine. Yeah. Is what I'm Yeah. Describing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Taylor Treddy Nick says, from what your view, what separates your coaching programs from other weightlifting coaches? Joe, this reminds you. I have an answer for this. Joe, I, I have five points written out. You have five points? Yeah. I'm going to sum it up in it's our particular flavor. Yeah. Uh, so this is our Sika Strength flavor, the Sika Sound flavor, uh, the Garth and Fitz own and Dara flavor is what would separate us from uh, coaching at the moment and for the foreseeable future is as much an art as it is a science. So it's an art based propped up with scientific principles but then the flavor you put on your coaching is how you make you know great athletes uh, if if you could work you would just give everyone the same program for the next four years and it would work yeah i think there there's definitely some things with our flavor that we have massive advantages over people we get the salt play favoring uh we get to talk to and deal with a huge amount of high level people and we've been dealing with and talking with them and annoying them with questions for a long time, you know. And I think that's something that isn't available to a lot of coaches. It's just whatever. Myself and Gurf were plopped out on a fairly similar patch of land. And through the things that have happened to us, we get these opportunities. And through multiple other decisions we've made, we got to be in the right rooms at the right places, which made us incredibly lucky that we got to to deal with these people and talk to these people. And then the other advantage we have, or two other advantages is, firstly, we have a massive sample size. We've coached a lot of people over the years. We've coached them both with templated programs that they buy and we deal with them on a weekly basis or every couple of weeks we'll see how they're getting on. We have thousands of people have run certain programs and we understand how most people will react to certain kinds of programming. And then we've been coaching people one-to-one -one for a long time, you know, we were talking about thousands of months of programming just built up over those years of, of coaching. Uh, and the last thing is that model, that flavor that me and Gurf have kind of agreed on. We we just disagreed on something there, but most of our days are spent saying, oh, what are you doing with him there? Or what's this? What's she doing now for this week? You know, and, and kind of bouncing ideas off each other. And that's massive. Uh, certainly when I was coaching people kind of out on my own an awful lot more um, when I had much more one-to-one -one interaction with people in a gym setting you don't get that kind of bouncing ideas off with people you don't have 10 spreadsheets open in front of you and then me looking across Garf looking across and then us kind of bouncing different ideas off or seeing the videos that other athletes are sending in and, and seeing how they're reacting so I think that model is something that has changed a lot over the years but it's much more defined or much more refined now than it, it ever has been i think uh so obviously 
to add what Fitz is saying, you know, the experiences we've had, the particular way our brains are made up, the experience we've had in sports, our desire to learn different things. Uh, but as much as that is just the practical experiences, you know, our programming has barely changed since we started because we knew it worked and now we've seen it work a lot more. And aside from literally some minor percentage adjustments in some of our programs along the way from seeing how, you know, there's nearly a thousand people in the Facebook group and it's probably, you know, thousands of programs sold and we get a lot of feedback from people, which is great. And we always like to hear the feedback. Uh, you know, it hasn't changed that much. So we've been able to reinforce really well what's worked for us. Uh, but I think the best way to sum up is just that's our particular flavor, you know, and a lot of certain people are suited for certain flavors or prefer certain flavors. Um, yeah, I think that's probably it. Yeah. Uh, Evan Lee, speaking of one-to-one -one athletes, Evan Lee says, congrats on your first jiu-jitsu comp. Question, are there optimal times to train during the day, 10 a.m., 3 p.m., etc.? What makes them better than others? So there certainly is um, certain times for a lot of people. So in general, right, high-skilled, high-force, high-speed movements in particular in the morning tend not to be best. In the morning, we tend to be able to do our strength training. We tend to be able to do accessory work. But most of the time, and it's it's due to the fact that the spine has been horizontal for so long and all axial loading is gone when you're sleeping. And then when we wake up, that kind of axial loading, the central nervous system is really firing. It's not going to be the best time for me to do a snatch with good speed and good technique. It's not going to be the best time to do a broad jump, a sprint, a high jump, whatever that is but you can still get a lot of valuable training done in the morning. In general, once we've had a, a, a decent amount of time under the force of gravity and our spine is stacked up, we have some axial loading, then we start to see those speed values, those high skill movement values improving, the quality of the movement will improve, and usually later in the afternoon tends to be better for those. Now, I have no doubt that if you condition someone from a very young age, this level of reaction, this level of uh, priming would increase. And obviously with an effective warm up, you can increase those things incredibly well. But most of the time doing those high skill stuff in the evenings works quite well. Now, for me, 7 p.m. in the evening is like, boom, that's perfect. Uh, realistically, since the age of 12, I've been training at 7 p.m. in the evening, multiple evenings a week. And I don't think that's ever going to change for me now. For someone else, it might be 4 p.m. is more effective. For someone else, it might be 8 or 9 p.m. is more effective. And um, There's a huge amount of other stuff going on there, though, than just the, the kind of readiness of the body, the readiness of the central nervous system. You also have to think about uh, the pattern of your sleep. So if you're somebody who tends to wake up earlier in the morning and want to go to bed earlier in the evening, then training at 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening isn't going to suit you. Uh, if you're somebody who tends to struggle with their sleep a lot or can't get to sleep quite well training late in the evening probably won't work well for you uh there's just a lot of other things nutritional timing obviously comes into effect restrictions on your own movement or restrictions in nutritional intake tends to have a massive effect where if you're in a job where you can't be eating at your desk or you're in, finish, yeah. in like education where you can't be eating bang on time uh we we always tell people like you must eat two hours beforehand or it's really good if you have 40 grams of carbohydrates within 45 minutes of finishing training in a lot of cases there's restrictions there and we're not necessarily able to just do what we want all the time uh so a lot of like there's a lot of intrapersonal differences uh one friend of ours who's a very very good international weightlifter says 3 p.m is the worst time possible 3 p.m no 4 4 4 is it 4 4 p.m 4 p.m 4 p.m he says no heavy weights get lifted when you train at 4 p.m uh and he likes the stack training around that. It's like the there used to be an ad, a soup ad in Ireland, and called it the 3 p.m. slump. Um, there are definitely waves, and, and our body is at different levels of readiness throughout the day, which I'm sure Garf is going to talk about now. Um, but I think a lot of it is personal to do with your own habits, what you've done for multiple years in a row, and also how your day daily hours are, are stacked up. Uh, that the uh, brain activity thing was something Matthew Walker talked about in that basically pretty much every human's brain reducing activity post like 12, one o'clock until about four o'clock. Um, it's just a, I, I don't think they, spe I think the speculation was that getting ready for 
uh, like diurnal hunting habits, you know. So anyone who wants knows when most a lot of animals are very active early morning or, or twilight in the morning or dawn really and twilight at night. It's referred to as crepuscular. Crepuscular. Yeah. Um, so is that's kind of they speculate that might be why that happens. I don't have a good reason, but it's very consistent, apparently, uh, is that people's brain activity, regardless of their hormonal activity, and I'm sure it's it's related, obviously, but uh, even if you know you're highly insulin sensitive, whatever, just brain activity seems to reduce. Now, does that matter for physical activity? Mm, it depends on what the physical activity is. I think it really comes down to physical activity. You know, your brain is massively plastic. It's funny, like every 10 years, they push back every 10 years how long your brain stays plastic. Uh, currently, they think it stays plastic into your 40s uh, when it originally was like, after 10, you're fucked. Yeah, I remember there being a shift around the time when I had a lot of concussions. There was a shift from it being. 14 or 15 years old in males to 22 in males. And yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. I won't be like this forever. Now there's like, now they're breaking down into the parts. So I think it's like the, the front, the lobus thing is saying plastic basically your whole life. Um, and some of the interesting things actually is like the monophenol and Adderall drugs negatively affect the passivity. Even one use of those can negatively affect the passivity of that particular part of your brain, uh, which is quite interesting. Very off topic though. So on to Tom Ash. Good afternoon. What is your opinion on 20 rep squat workouts for getting size and strength? Uh 20 reps is just too far away from the sports sick activity, which is one furry size. Technically, that would work if you did enough volume and enough weight. I think 20 reps for strength is like as Gareth said, you're so far away from, from realistically important weights, it's not going to be effective. One thing though, the 20 rep squats can be very good for is people who are trying to lose body mass or body fat in particular your post exercise oxygen consumption after doing five sets of 20 at a, a difficult weight is going to be absolutely massive due to the amount of tissue breakdown so it's not just the use of glycogen during those squats but you're really damaging those tissues and then you have to use a lot of energy to to replenish that system itself so if you're somebody and you're using exercise as a form of caloric uh expenditure when you're really really trying to lose weight i think 20 squat 20 squat workouts 20 rep squat workouts can be effective in the same way where interval sprints on the bike can be effective crossfit style workouts can be effective you're just burning as much energy as possible uh, and the advantage of the 20 rep squat stuff is that you you burn energy for a long time following the the cessation of exercise not just when you're in the gym uh, Gabe was saying in the exercise for cricket bowling, so you'd follow the same principles in any power production or or high velocity movements. You know, you'd practice things at speed, at sport specific speed. Uh, you in training, you'd be addressing your deficits in your force production, or you'd be looking at your um, uh, force velocity curve, your own kind of personal one. Would you say, am I quite weak to where I should be? Am I slow in certain exercises? Do I have the capacity to produce force in certain exercises? Uh, do I get a, a velocity meter for a barbell? Uh, am I strong enough? You know, do I have certain body weight ratios to strength movements? Are some of those high enough? But is my speed really slow? So you just look at those particular ones. I don't think there's any particular uh, exercise for increasing cricket bowling in say, per se, because obviously SNC is general and it's not really specific. One thing I probably would pay attention to, especially with all throwers, we see a lot of shoulder damage over the course of their careers. So looking at, you know, rear delts, mid traps, supraspinatus, uh, rotator cuff work, uh, mobility, elasticity of the fascia and joints and the uh, muscle tissues around there, the suppleness of them um, was what I'd be looking at for sure. No exercise in particular, though, but good training principles is what I'd be looking for a cricket bowling. Bowling. One other thing, I wasn't really paying attention to what Gareth said because I listened to what he said at the start and I knew I knew where he was going with that. One thing I'd be really conscious of, and this comes up in a couple of different sports, um, it comes up in fencing and stuff like that as well, where you're really dominant on one side, you tend to really, the amount of overuse injuries is massive. So you'll see it in badminton players. Uh, you'll obviously see it in tennis players' elbows, as in tennis elbow. You'll see it in golfers. Um, you being the most strong organism in that case, for me, is the most important thing. So a lot of people will try and do this thing, like particularly with archers and stuff, where they're pulling quite hard on one side, 
and they'll try and overemphasize the use of the non-dominant side in the gym. They'll try and do more work there. You'll see people with a pec imbalance and they'll try and press more on the other side. Just focusing on the actual 1RM number is so, so valuable in that case. The kind of bilateral transfer that happens when you're up towards those higher numbers is massive. So it would just be conscious of that of, don't necessarily need to do more work on your left hand if you're right-handed, but really focusing on getting those press numbers, those rowing numbers uh, as high as possible will be very, very valuable for you. Uh, okay. Somebody says, so Ritik Nair says, just there, the strength training today, ask the grass squats, RDLs. I want you to add two things into that. And that's a strict overhead press and a fairly strict bent over row. And I think you'll be great. Um, sorry, I was just reading the comments of Zach. Thomas yeah, so was I. Like, of course, we're not going to answer the Israel and Ukraine thing. I didn't. I, know. I didn't even know Israel were involved in the talks. Like, it's not. What would we add to that conversation in relation to that? Will we pick a few random questions? Yeah, there's a few I want to answer. Okay. Uh, uh, so the first thing is. What are you looking at? I'm just gonna pick a random one. Oh, sorry, I thought you asked her. So, one I'm gonna answer is Len Ken it says, "Any chance of seek strength rash guards in the future?" I think yes, absolutely. And geese, it would be geese first. Yeah, the geese because the geese look unbelievable with I'm like covered in dragons. No, the geese will be like covered really, in dragons, really covered simple, in dragons, really with simple dragons. design and dragons inside. Like if you saw dragons some of the rings. stuff from the competition, was yeah. there pictures of the geese up there? Yeah, but you didn't see the ones with the dragon. We samurai. weren't we weren't wearing those geese, but the good because they had no dragons and samurais. But the good jujitsu people were who we wear dragons uh, and samurais. Those geese look great. Yeah. It'll just be very very simple with dragons and samurais for the rash guards. Those are also are dragons probably samurais. going to have some heavy dragon and strength samurais. dragons and samurais. Dragons and samurais. There we go. Uh, now we're getting them. it, and we'll probably have some sort of mountain dragons man, and Eastern European warrior on them with dragons and samurais. Yeah. There we go. Um, so as is your, I've got a really simple answer for you. So anyone for your drills to encourage foot stomp and snatch and clean, uh, no foot movements, ironically enough. Uh, it just really encourages the correct timing. And when you have your timing down, you can move your feet correctly. Most time people can't move their feet correctly because their timing positions are down. And funnily enough, no foot stuff works really well to encourage the timing for good foot movement. Uh, Archer Joe, I want to answer this. You said people used to take testosterone from eating pig testicles. Is that actually a thing you were joking? So they didn't they didn't eat them, they just purified the juices from the testicles and then they injected that. And funny enough, they were getting a bit of testosterone from that. Not much, but they were getting something. Uh well, uh, when you're pressing 120, what were you able to play for six, eight, and ten reps? I'm just shooting towards a benchmark. So I don't remember the other numbers, but I know. I was trying for a very long time to press 100 kilos for five. And then once I got 100 kilos for five, I shortly after got 120. Aaron, Aaron McKinnon, anyone who follows Seeker Strength on, on uh, Instagram will undoubtedly have seen Aaron in our stories a lot. Uh, Canadian weightlifter with a very nice squat. Not that his weightlifting numbers aren't nice too, but a very nice squat. Aaron asks, I've been programming for a new or for a few functional fitness athletes. I cross with athletes, I assume. Uh, I was curious what your thoughts would be on re the result of replacing all kipping pull ups and chest of bears with strict pull ups for four to six weeks. What are your thoughts on this? So, there's two things I want to look at initially, right? So, the first thing is the idea of replacing them with strict work for four to six weeks from a preparatory phase is ideal. That's kind of what you want to be doing. But there's a caveat to that. So, the first caveat to that is the most important thing in a prep phase is the total volume we do over the course of the prep phase, ensuring the intensity isn't too high and that the volume is high enough where we're really getting that adaptation we want. For a lot of people, depending on their level of proficiency with pull-ups, strict pull-ups, strict chest bear pull-ups, strict chin-ups, they might not be able to achieve enough volume during the prep phase for it to be effective. So that's the first thing. The intensity might be too high. They might not be strong enough, but they're ability to get the volume won't be there. So they might not be effective in that case. Oh yeah, I'll you by accident. They might not be effective in that case to go to strict pull-up work. Something like assisted strict pull-ups in that case would be very, very good. So you're still getting really controlled movements. More importantly than anything else, you're getting a really controlled 
and slow down eccentric uh, portion of the movement, which is the most important thing, particularly during a prep phase, that eccentric should be elongated, should be made as difficult as possible. The second thing I would say is that ensuring that four to six weeks is a prep phase and it's not pre-competition. So if we get somebody like the skill of a kipping pull-up, the skill of a kipping or butterfly chest to bear pull-up, kipping muscle-ups, all these things are really, really high skill. So they need to be practiced. But also there's a huge amount of force going down through their, their joints, their ligaments, their tendons. And it's something that that resilience needs to be built over a, a period of time. So if they are four months out from, from competition, then you do six to eight weeks of strict work. And then you bring in their more specific competition work and they have time to adapt then they have time to build that skill and then they have time to build that skill in realistic rep ranges uh i think it's very very applicable but if the competition is eight weeks away and we spend four to six weeks doing strict work and then only bring in the specific kipping work or butterfly work at the end you do tend to get issues with the shoulders the elbows the wrists because those joints and tendons don't adapt quite as fast as we often think they will um, Connor is joining a weighty club this evening and he's wanting advice. Uh, so follow any rules they have, uh, try your best to make friends with them, <laughs> listen to the coaches with advice to the best of your ability, and uh, just enjoy it. Just make yeah. sure you just don't stick out like a sore thumb, you know, do your best, bring clean gear, clean clothes, clean up after yourself. All just good etiquette, good manners, be a normal person. Be a good athlete and you'll be fine. The other thing I would say is that like your first few times training in a gym, like that's not that people oftentimes think this is my time to prove myself. This is my time. I've been training for a year or two years and I need to show them how good my technique is. I need to show them what weights I can lift. I need to show them how well I move around. Uh, those kind of opinions, although first opinions are important, realistically in a coaching context or a sporting context, they're formed over the course of months and, and multiple training sessions. It's your consistency and, and that kind of general etiquette that Garth talked about is going to be much, much more important in your first session. You know, don't take things too seriously. You need to be there. You need to train well. You need to listen to what people say. This isn't the time for, oh, I always go straight to 70 kilos on my warm up. If they're all going 40, then 50, then 60, then you go 40, then 50, then 60. You kind of have to tow the the party line on that one and and just try and slot in as best you can and then you're you can showcase your talents at different points but the first kind of month of being there really isn't the time for that okay okay banana bread says you mentioned not using equipment to mimic sports specific movement but judo uses a lot of band training to mimic pulling spinning etc thoughts on this only advisable if live judo partners unavailable. So the thing is when you're trying to mimic, so there's two different streams to this, right? The first one is where I'm mimicking a movement and really specifically trying to be faster, stronger, more powerful with that movement. The second thing is, is you can be mimicking that movement to try and be more skilled, more coordinated, just practicing that motor pattern over and over in your head, right? So let's take the judo throw as an example. I'm going to be much more effective if I need to be bigger, stronger, faster at a judo throw. I'm going to be much more effective if I get a bigger deadlift, get a bigger hang power clean, uh, work on my anti-rotational stuff, work on my midline stuff, right? Become stronger, become a better athlete. I'll be more powerful at those judo throws. The second case, though, and where you might see the proper application of those bands for pulling, spinning, foot placement, uh, shoulder rotation, anti-rotational work, is that they're practicing a really specific motor pattern. So it's obviously going to be more effective if if I hold girth and I can throw girth, but it might be a thing where girth is too heavy for me to do it with, right? Or my skill currently isn't at the level where I can do the full throw, and I might just need to use that band or something like a gi on a door to just hold myself there, and I just practice the foot movement as I move my upper body. Then once I get to a certain level of that, and I can do the foot movement followed by a hip rotation or the foot movement followed by a shoulder rotation, then a live grappling partner might become more and more useful for me. But there are certainly cases where the use of a band just to practice with foot placement, to practice with timing of the movement can be effective. 
you can do a hell of a lot more reps than you can if you were throwing a 100 kilo person or a 130 kilo person over your shoulder every time. Uh, but it's probably not the best thing to do if you were trying to get specifically stronger and faster, more powerful. Uh, there's probably better tools to do that. Um, on the, the judo one, so I know you're talking about sport specific movements, or I assume you're talking about sport specific movements to practice the kind of technique. But also when we're practicing sport specific stuff, we're enhancing the quality, force production, speed, motor recruiter movements of our muscles and our CNS, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we all get that, right? Um, so if we think about it in terms of when we're doing training to improve a certain sport specific movement, there is in a shock to no one muscles, tendons, CNS, all involved in that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking a jab at your man, by the way, I'm just talking about it in general. Uh, everyone gets that. Absolutely. Nobody's shocked by that. So if we think about the scenarios, we go to the gym and we look at what we're doing in the gym. And if I am, for example, a particular favorite of mine, breaking someone's grip on the collar of my sleeve, uh, very successfully, I haven't met someone who can hold on to it yet. And so if we look at what's involved with that, we're looking at uh, lats, mid traps, thoracic, uh, fucking super spinatus, some bicep, forearm, some hips and quads. Hip, hips, quads. We're looking at all of the muscles involved in this. And so we go, okay, these are the muscles involved. I want to train these muscles as best as possible. When I go to the gym, do I ask Dara to lie down on the floor and do four sets of 10 of grip breaking? So no, I don't. That's not Dara won't be there. That's not consistent. That's not reproducible. That is not something that we can pin down the variables of. We can't be consistent with the amount of force used. We can't progress or regress that really to a, a consistent extent. So we could ask Dara to hold tighter or looser, but we can't really do that. But if we have dumbbells from two kilos to 60 kilos, I can warm up. I can do sets and reps with a certain number of dumbbells. I can be sure in a controlled environment that I'm engaging certain muscles, the ones I'm looking to use for that sport specific movement. I can progress these. I can regress these very, very adequately because I know gravity is not changing. And as long as chunks aren't falling out of those dumbbells, I know those dumbbells are remaining consistently from week to week. Uh, so aside from the sport specific motor unit recruitment thing, aside from the speed of training slow and all that stuff and altering movements, and accommodating resistance is, you know, a different aspect. But if you just look at even strengthening the muscles involved, um, we know that there's just a better scenario of using controlled environment, the gym equipment for training specific stuff. Now, I know you're saying in this scenario um, that if there's no other partners involved, I know Dara's saying there's probably not a bad scenario, but I think it's likely, it's it definitely has the potential a significant potential more than you would uh, be happy to take. I think using bands have a negative consequence yeah. on your habits. So uh, there's a lot of re good research on say, if we take weighted baseball bats are certainly negative. There's a, there's even a meta analysis a few months ago. I saw weighted implements have negative impacts on sports specific movements and throwing, you know, kind of broader context is quite similar to it's the same principles, same, you know, fast movement, uh, using an external object to our body, uh, moving through space as fast as possible, applying force and all that, um, that I would be hesitant to use resistance bands or something like that to practice those. Uh, would I, however, bow aside to a very experienced judo coach who's produced multiple Olympic champions? And he said, you know what? These actually work really well. Now, I don't have any papers to prove this, but I know it works really well for my athletes. Then I'd be like, okay, perfect. Yeah. I'd be like, that's hundred percent. I'd be all over that. But I would say on the outside, probably has a negative impact. Yeah. Overall. I think it you kind of have to look at how the band is being used as well, you know, because if it's in a really technical aspect, a lot of time the band is there to mimic the grip or mimic the grip you have over someone else in like a judo context, you're probably not even pulling against the band that much, you know. You might just be using it to kind of set yourself in space and understand where you are in space and in those cases it's like shadow boxing it's like doing those tumbles and rolls yourself on the a padded floor you know you're not the strength of the band or pulling against the band isn't the important piece it's moving your yourself through space is the important piece and in that case it's probably not that negative but definitely if you're pulling against it or really trying to put force into it, it it's not it's probably not it I wonder if you had 
uh, accommodating resistance, you know, like over speed with the throw. So, oh my god, that'd be amazing. You pull the band back, and then you go, and then you go for your throw. That might actually, in theory, would be beneficial. So, instead of going the opposite direction, so having the band here and throwing into the band, you would have you'd pull the band back to your position, you go to the start position of your throw. So, the band, if you imagine, is pulling you forward into it, and you're resisting it at the start position. And then you go into the troll. That technically might work. I want to do those right now. That might actually do something. I don't know if there's any research on that or um because it's hard to measure the variables of velocity and stuff, you know, in training and power production without ad adequate equipment. So the, technically that might work, like overspeed training, accommodating resistance, um, you know, assisted jumping, all produce more power, uh, downhill running and all that kind of stuff. Um, that would be that might technically work, but I don't know if you could really recreate the exact pattern maybe for a very experienced i know that of judo you'll see them just practice the throws against the wall so they'll yeah. kind of have the leg sweeps um uh, in jiu-jitsu they don't even like takedowns so i can't give any practical recommendations because they just don't like it banana bread one thing i will say um because you're asking these kind of questions that i think will be interesting for you we did a review of a judo player or a judoko is that what they call it judo judo kai? Judo kai? Uh, Oh, His no. name is Onoshe, a Korean. Onoshoshe. 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 But we did a review of that. Um, you'll be able to find it on our channel. I'll go and look at now. his training. Gurf Gar is just putting a link in. Go and look at his training because his this training, unbelievable. from what we have seen was amazing. from the judo world, and we, we've kind of delved into it a small bit. We're by no means um, comprehensive in our searching, but from all that we have seen, he seems to be the best in terms of the SNC work he does. Uh, so go and look at that. It might give you some ideas. Jeez, judo is so vicious, isn't it? Oh, my God. See when they slam them on their heads? So okay. vicious. Uh, I have okay. one more question I'm going to answer. Okay. Before we answer that question, I'm done. we have a training camp in mid-April. 15th to the 18th. 15th to the 18th of April. It's for four days. If you're interested, send us an email now because we only have a couple of spots left. So do send us an email as soon as possible. You'll get training programs leading up to the, the event itself. So you're used to training with us. You know how the training sessions go. We'll have an idea of your technique and what you need to work at when you're at the camp. And you'll get more out of the camp that way. The second thing is merchandise will be available in the coming days. Within the next probably seven to eight days, there'll be merchandise available for sale. It's all right there. It's right in there. Just there. It's waiting to go. As Garf explained at the start, we're waiting. There's a national holiday this week. Uh, and so it mightn't be the best thing. But once it's up, you guys and girls will know about it. Uh, and any other questions, any other questions about our products, all of that, you can get us at seekerstrength at gmail.com or go to the website seekerstrength.com and there's a contact us uh, box there. Um before we go, banana bread, if you have any recommendations for athletes with good SNC training who are judo, uh, I'd be very interested to see them because I'm looking at the George Fonese Fonseca. Is, is he French? Um, doing stuff here and it doesn't look great. Uh, Road to Tokyo. Though, <clears> obviously, he's a, he's a beast. J Fonseca. I did say I'd answer one more question. Oh, oh yeah, he's doing exactly what he said, don't do. And his rules. That's the yeah. Thing. I will answer one more question, and that's Smith Jitsu says advice on training on a tight time budget. Just had a new baby and finding time for jiu jitsu and lifting can be challenging. So, firstly, congratulations on that. Uh, that's great to hear. But time restricted training, there's a couple of things you really, really need to be better at than on time restricted training. The first thing is your actual schedule. So, really pick. Like your jiu-jitsu classes throughout the week, just pick what ones you're going to. Don't change that. Don't alter that in any way. Just make that your priority as a sport-specific training. Realistically, if you're time-restricted and you're going to roll probably twice a week, being in the gym twice a week is probably as much as you're going to be there. Uh, I would say when you're time-restricted in gym training, make sure your needs analysis or your understanding of what you need to get better at is where you should spend the most time it's like the old adage of if i have two hours to cut down the tree i'll spend an hour and a half sharpening the axe you need to do all the planning before you start doing the gym work so if you're somebody who is very strong but you have poor mobility or you're very strong and your speed is very poor then you need to be focusing the majority of those realistically 
two 45 minute long sessions you need to be focusing all of that in that direction uh, or if your strength is poor you need to focus it all in the strength direction you need to be hyper conscious of that there's no point going to the gym and doing a general workout if you can only work out for two 45 minute sessions per week uh, you need to be like a shark with a laser beam on your head uh, and the last thing i will say is for those gym sessions when you're going into training a lot of time we'll have our four or five exercises or two exercises and three supersets or two exercises and two supersets i will put specific time domains on each of those uh zero minutes to 10 minutes in i'm warming up 11 minutes to 16 minutes in i'm going to be doing my box jumps 17 minutes to 27 minutes i'm going to do my back squats then 28 minutes to 45 minutes i'm going to do my two supersets and really really be diligent with those uh if you want an example of what one of those sessions will look like look at my training vlog from five weeks ago at uh, basically the training vlog that was in my shed i think i was doing judo throws in the same training session uh or in the same training vlog sorry but you'll see those how it was broken up where it's bang on on the minute down to the minute everything is planned out there was a lot in that training session it took 45 or 46 minutes um and yeah that should help i wonder would judo throws be unique in the aspect that as you're pulling someone off the ground, they are also getting heavier relative to you. So yeah. there's less of their support on the ground and their weight is technically getting heavier. And then yeah. resistant bands, of course, there is the, the weight is also getting heavier as you pull more. So with that, I wonder, would, would judo throws be really unique in that aspect? See, also when you look at the bands for judo throws, the bands are always going to weigh less than the person. Yeah. You'll never have a band where it's like the same as 50 kilos or whatever you know yeah but i wonder would i get what you mean so like but how much of the throw is momentum like at what point do your muscles are not engaged you know when someone has started the throw you if you look at to... these boys they're still driving them into the ground they're still driving them in yeah so is it possible that the resistant bands in, in judo throws are super unique look at that. fucking hell oh no she is some he is a horse Fuck me. Look at that. That is ridiculous. I love when their foot comes over their head. Yeah. Oh, my God. What an animal. Holy shit. Okay, we need to go. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you all again soon. Email us. Talk to us if you have questions. And we'll... Uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Jesus. So